Straight up, yep. Nope, not what I wanted. Um, and I'll do a little um, quick intro just by reaching the, um, the, 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 well, I should move on the um, mountain. <laughs> Creative New Zealand, etc. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who are, um, funding, funding yeah. everything so that cool. all these people in front of you yeah. can sit here. <laughs> yeah, sweet. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I had heaps this morning saying, "Oh, can I watch it? Or can I Chromecast this?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. If you have Chromecast. I was, I was, I was like, mm, it's actually a technical question, <laughs> you know. Like, I need more information to answer. Yeah. I think so, yes. Yes. If you know how you can um, Chromecast anything, is what I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and then we got back to me and go, oh, I did this one. Well, that's sick. Shouldn't we talk about that? They're probably. <laughs> probably everyone else is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <clears throat> mm. oh, I was sitting waiting for me to. Do something, no, she's live looking at my bald head. <laughs> oh, you said no, no real limits to what you're doing. Yeah. 12 30 ish, I meant to be starting in the end. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Most of the sign ups are probably watching you as well, so the, yeah. The shouldn't be a big, should be all right. yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be a big That's issue. Good. So, yeah, 12 30, I need to start there. Yeah. Well, I, I hadn't said this to anyone, and I should have yesterday. Yeah. We're a little bit careful about language. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. I'll try my best. Sometimes it slips out um, and lessons and that's that little like. <laughs> I was at a school once and, and, and suddenly all the kids were like, oh. Oh, gosh. And I the teacher's looking at me and I don't even know. And I oh. said, well, what did I say? Yeah. And he, he said it. And the teacher came over and he said, it was stats belief. I'm like, oh, no, no, I didn't. I did oh, not. Oh, no. And the whole room's telling me I did and I yeah. still can't remember it. It's too casual, right? Yeah. We um, played on RNZ and I didn't think about it, but... Yeah, there's a S-H-I-T word in there. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think about it, but neither did the other person. And they checked it, it was fine. And then when they played it afterwards, um, so Jesse Mulligan, I was like, so right. sorry about that terrible word that was in there. <laughs> I was like, oh, what terrible word? Like, I even heard it and was like, what is he talking about? Yeah. What have we went through? Like, yeah. <laughs> oops. Well, we've all done that. Like. that no. Whoopsie. I can't see the number count, but I can see uh, that it's been live for three minutes. Okay. I'm doing weird things. Normally I use my phone and it's a sort of much better picture. Than yeah. Um, today, I work for Facebook, but I can change things all the time. And yeah, like, yeah. Oh, so I can't use my phone anymore. I have to go to a computer. How oh, many really? people? You can't use your phone. Some well, it's not leaving me at the moment. I've always used it. It's yeah. just yesterday. It's suddenly I was. I went to my That's MacBook terrible. that didn't have a microphone, and then oh my goodness. Oh, no. mm. Yeah, it was a bit scary. Yeah. All right, it says it's live. Oh yeah, this is what we can do. These people here. Yeah. I won't tell you how many people you <laughs> Oh, can see me. Turn the volume down. Remind me how to say your name. Dan. 
Teddy Urquhart. Urquhart, yeah. Urquhart, yeah. Is there Urquhart's down the valley that related to you? I have no idea. There's a singing. She, she runs one of the local choirs. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. It's my husband's song? name. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I figured, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, someone called you Danny Unique and I can't get it in my Oh, that's head. quite cool. Oh, I thought that was oh, great. I like that. That's like a pro wrestling name. <laughs> nice, yeah. so it's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to go um, ahead with um, the workshop now and I'd like to start with saying um, a huge thank you and shout out to um, the Creative New Zealand, the Arts Council and the Waitaki District Council without whom none of this would be possible and um, we're so grateful for their, their, their help and funding and um, uh, everything they do. They're, they're pretty amazing to our community here. So. So without any more ado, I'm going to introduce you to Danny Urquhart, if I said her name Perfect, right. Yeah. Perfect, even. <laughs> All right, and, and you will, will enjoy this, trust me. <laughs> cool. Okay. I'm going to start with breathing, because I thought I could babble on about psychology for so long that I should probably start with breathing, <laughs> so then I know how much time I have left. I don't go too far with it. So, firstly, who am I and why am I talking to you and why do I know what I'm talking about? I am Teddy Urquhart. I have been teaching singing for about nine years, I think. Um, I started by moving to Dunedin. I live in Dunedin. I uh, studied at Otago University doing a Bachelor of Music, contemporary performance, singing. There's lots of sub brackets into that. My last year was honours year and I did audio engineering and vocal pedagogy which is just a fancy way of saying I know about the voice. After that I went into singing lessons mainly to fund me performing and songwriting um, but I got really into that as well. Uh, so I've been doing it for a while now. Um, I definitely have different ideas from when I started to what I have now and I think that's why I enjoy talking about it and I enjoy talking about the psychology of singing because it's something that I've really gotten into over the past maybe four or so years. Um, but breathing, breathing. Breathing is the foundation of singing. Um, pretty much every time I meet a new student, I'm like, do you know about diaphragmatically breathing? Uh, it's something that comes up just every half an hour of my life, I think, <laughs> where I'm like, are you diaphragmatically breathing? Who do you think you're breathing from? How do you think you're breathing? Um, and it's always the first thing I talk to with my students. So we're obviously good at breathing. We know how to breathe because we're alive. I think that in most of our lives we chest breathe. Uh, the understanding I have, which I might be wrong, but that's fine. I think we all live stressful lives and therefore we're all panic breathing most of the time. And we're just going to get ourselves through the day. And I think that if we all diaphragmatically breathe all the time and not just when we're singing or diving or doing Pilates or doing mindfulness, if we just did it all the time, we'd be more carefree, I think, even in the stress of our lives. So I try and diaphragmatically breathe all the time. So although this is a focus on singing diaphragmatically, if you learn how to diaphragmatically breathe, I definitely recommend you doing it as much as possible. Um, okay, I'll teach you how to get into diaphragmatically breathing. It's actually really handy to have to um, If you go under your ribs and then fake laugh, and I know everybody hates this, <laughs> but as soon as you start fake laughing, you start really laughing at yourself. Um, most of the time people are laughing at me. So either way, you can laugh at me or laugh at yourself, but laugh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you're laughing, do you feel it going out? Do you see mine going out? <laughs> I'm wearing a nice drapey dress so you get to see the jiggle. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what you're wanting. That part where it goes out is called your obliques. So now if you keep your hands there and just breathe into that and feel it going out and back in. 
the chest and shoulders shouldn't be going like this, but this should be going out. When I first did this, uh, I was at university, it was a long time ago, and I said to my vocal teacher, I don't have obliques, um, because I genuinely couldn't feel them. And so that happens to some people, and that's fine. Just keep kind of moving around. I've never done it. I've never actually gone up to someone and been like, this is where they are. But he did, and it was super helpful, because I was like, would you look at that? Apparently I do. Everybody's got them. Um, well, I imagine everybody's got them. <laughs> I'm sure there's the anomalies that don't. But I've never met anyone that doesn't. So they're right under your ribs, breathe into them. That's how to get into diaphragmatically breathing. It's not going to remain. It's probably immediately going to go back to chest breathing, and that's okay. But we'll keep trying to affirm that. So during this, feel free to keep putting your hands on your obliques. <laughs> I say hips. Um, I wanted to quickly talk about the, the previous learnings of diaphragmatically breathing, because when I was taught to diaphragmatically breathe, I was always taught to belly breathe. And a uh, little snippet into my childhood, I really liked Hilary Duff, and there was a movie that she was in that said, fat singing's good singing. And again, it's, it's the belly, and it's at the front. If you poke your belly out, then you're breathing well. And I don't really want you to focus on that. That does happen. Same with your back. Your back goes up too. These do happen, but I don't think that's the easiest way to approach it. Most people I have worked with find it much easier to work with your obliques. If your hands are on your tummy, your tummy moves when you're talking, or if you've eaten a lot, or you've drunk too much. Um, so the obliques are... A like nice hard muscle that are much more easy to find by laughing <laughs> and then breathing into. Um, a more kind of workout for this, because I have this, I may as well use it, right? Um, back onto your obliques, and we're going to do an exercise that sounds like this. Hee <laughs> hee, ha ha, ho 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 ho. The focus is, and I say like Santa, if you imagine what Santa's like, and he's like, ho, 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 and he's quite dramatic. That's what you're wanting to do. This is a workout. This is like running on a treadmill for your obliques and your diaphragm and all the muscles around. You're using a lot of muscles. You're not just using your obliques to stretch your diaphragm. You're using a lot of muscles. And this is like the biggest workout you can do for it. So, okay. Hee, hee, ha, ha. Ho 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 up ah, hee hee ha ha ho 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 last one hee hee ha ha ho 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 I don't know if there is a version of that on YouTube. I like haven't looked. There's lots of things on YouTube. Actually to the point of like it's kind of concerning. There's definitely not a lot of good information. There is a lot of information and some of it's good. Um I don't know if that's on YouTube. If it is, I have a YouTube. We could probably link it and I'll find it and I'll like it put it on a resource thing that I have. Um, I've never really thought about it, but it's a really good one just to get into obliques and try and feel what that's like in such an exaggerated way and be like, okay, I'm definitely diaphragmatically breathing because that was like, oh, and tiring. Um, <clears throat> how to maintain diaphragmatically breathing. It's tricky because it's a habit. What did I hear? It's like, it takes six weeks to build a habit. Um, and that's working hard on it. Uh, my advice is always when you're doing the dishes or going for a little wander, um, doing real basic things that you do in your everyday life, just consciously think, I'm going to diaphragmatically breathe. To start with, if you have to go like this, and go, then do that. That's fine. Um, eventually, you can just be doing the dishes and switch make sure that you're diaphragmatically breathing. That is building the habit in your everyday life. Meaning, you will diaphragmatically breathe when you want to. Definitely, always, and I know people are like, I don't like to warm up. I'm gonna go into why you have to warm up. But always do some sort of breathing to warm up. I'm gonna give you other um, exercises that are much more basic than hee hee, because that's quite, quite demanding. But, okay, warm up. We don't like to warm up, we don't like to spend that extra time, but 
It's like going to the gym and just immediately jumping into weights. I don't know how many people have done that. I've definitely done that, it hurts. Um, you are in pain a lot longer as well. If you stretch and slowly build up the blood running to those muscles and then you work out, it's a lot better. And these are massive muscles you're working with. Your arms are huge muscles, your legs are huge muscles, and you really feel it when you don't stretch. These are tiny muscles. These are really small muscles, and they really need blood to go to them. If you strain these muscles or hurt these muscles, it takes a lot longer to fix. I don't know if you've lost your voice, but it takes a long time to get your voice back um, and a lot of care. So we don't want to put too much demand on our voice, especially belters. Um, I am a belter, and I know that I have a warm up. Just do it in the car. That's always what I do. <laughs> Try not to do breathing in the car or the shower because you might pass out, but definitely do vocal exercises in the car. It's great in the traffic line. <laughs> you make nice, weird eye contact with people, and it's hilarious. Um, okay, different exercises. Uh, I call this triangle breathing probably has many different names and it's used in many different areas like I mentioned before diving and swimming um, diaphragmatically breathing is taught in many different ways and has many different uses uh, there's a great video on um, like g-forces the the training to be in a rocket and you have to be like <laughs> uh, that kind of breathing is yeah breath work for me in so many different areas of life and so many different ways to do it we're quite chill how <laughs> we do it as long as you're diaphragmatically breathing you're good <laughs> so triangle breathing is basically you're breathing in you're holding and you're breathing out you kind of pick what number you want you don't want it to be too quick you don't want to hard to ventilate i think a good number to start with is four to six i go with six six count ideally you would use something like a metronome because you could just in your head be like one two three four five six <laughs> but you don't want to do that you want to be like one two, three, four, five, six. Seems like a lot longer of a time. Um, I'm going to allow you to do it. I can't do it and say one, two, three, four, five, six at the same time. So I'm just going to instruct you on how to do it. Uh, feel free to do it if you want to. This is a good one just before warming up, um, just to get into this long version, like controlled version of diaphragmatically breathing. So if we inhale, two, three, four, five, six, hold, two, three, four, five, six, S two, three, four, five, six. If that exhale is easy on S, try SH, SH, lets out a lot more air at once. Um, there is an exercise, Dr. Dan, he's a good one on YouTube actually, mm. he's an uh, Australian singer and teacher and he is one of the ones on YouTube that I'm like, go see him, everything he says is stuff that I'm like, okay. And he also resources, which is great, you can have the resources that he uses for his education, which is just, I mean, if you're looking for someone to listen to, definitely listen to someone who resources. Um, so yeah, he has an exercise CD and he does um, eight of that exercise and I think it goes up to 20. Um, if you're wanting an exercise CD, I do, I do recommend that. I'm not sponsored by him. Um, I just think that it, it genuinely is a good CD and that breathing exercise is really good. I definitely do that with all, all my students. Um, stable note. So that's just breathing, right? We have gotten to our obliques, we've breathed into our obliques, we understand that the tummy and the back go out, um, your chest still goes up a little bit but your shoulders don't raise, that's the biggest thing when you're chest breathing, or panic breathing is what I think of it as, um, your shoulders raise. <sighs> um, you also feel panicky just doing that, like if you want to hyperventilate or create a panic attack, that's how you do it. Um, education. <laughs> what I want on panic attacks. Um, the, the opposite of that creates more relaxing, right? Uh, so stable note. Stable note is basically bringing all that onto a note. Your exhale is your voice. When you breathe in, 
you're doing it in a controlled way so that when you breathe out, the voice is stable. That's why this is called stable neuro exercise. Um, also, your exhale is guided by these muscles. So if you chest breathe, you have a habit of dumping your voice. So if you're like, ah, it's kind of uncontrolled and a, and a release of something that you don't have the best control over. And to note, I do currently have a student who is really technically a good singer and she chest breathes. And um, she is the anomaly. There's always going to be them, right? And it frustrates me. She's so good. And it frustrates me that she's so good and she chest breathes. But it is what it is. <laughs> she has so, so good control of her voice that, and she's been doing it for so long that she can chest breathe and control her voice well. That's not how I would start singing or not how I would healthfully sing. So I'm still like, I have to sing because it's good for control. <laughs> but honestly, she's nailing it anyway. Um, if you're watching, you're welcome. <laughs> because she genuinely does and it shocks me every week. Um, so it's not to say that this is like the be all end all, right? But it is the foundation of. So if we go, same note, middle C is good for men and women, so it's just, if you want to start an exercise, middle C is the best place to start. So this exercise, breathing in if you need to, make sure you're breathing in with those, those obliques and not with your chest. And you're going to hold a note for as long as possible. I don't want you to hold the note until you're like collapsing. If you think about your breath like a balloon, if you blow up the balloon a little bit, it's really easy to blow it up and down to that little bit. But if you let it all the way out, it's hard to go and get it, the air in there again. It's the same thing. Don't collapse your chest. Don't lose all the air. I want you to keep some air. This is what it sounds like. E not letting your chest collapse. So we can do it together. Three, two, one. E singing since I was four. I'm really good at diaphragmatically breathing and I don't need the obliques. I don't even need my hand on my stomach. It's this weird little like um, emotional connection. <laughs> You're like, ah, if you're feeling it when your hands on your stomach for some reason. Well, I am. Okay. Uh, my last thing on breathing. <coughs> uh, I don't know if people have done mindfulness or body scans before. I think the more aware of our body we are, the better we are at uh, analyzing, understanding what it is we need to work on, where we're breathing from, uh, and emotions, we'll get into that. But for now, breathing. Knowing where you're breathing from, knowing where you're singing from, knowing what feels wrong or uncomfortable, it's very important. So. Uh, Mindfulness is basically relaxing the body to create awareness of the body, if that makes sense. So if you find a nice comfy position, you can sit back on your chair, um, close your eyes if you like. I'll give you like a minute to get comfortable. I want you to get comfortable. Try not lying down because you might fall asleep. Just like on the edge of a seat, nice and comfy, relaxing everything. It's okay if you're not fully relaxed, you'll get there. <laughs> I'm going to assume we're mostly on the edge of the seat, getting relaxed. You can close or half close your eyes. I'm going to take you through a body scan. I want you to think about the parts of the body I name. If you feel tension in that area, relax it. Um, you don't need to think that too hard. This is just getting to know the parts of your body, relaxing it, to feel relaxed in the awareness of your body. So. Starting between your eyes, down to your nose, to your chin, 
to your shoulders, to the whole of your left arm and left hand, to the whole of your right arm and right hand, to your abdomen, your hips, down the whole of your left leg and left foot, the whole of your right leg and right foot, and the whole of your body all together, the whole of your body all together. Now open your eyes. You can do that for a lot longer. I think the exercises I've done, I've done a few different mindfulnesses in terms of like breathing and singing um, on my YouTube and I think we're about five minutes. So you can do it for a lot longer. This is just a real quick version to try and get you to understand once you're relaxed and when you can analyze what's happening in your body, it's much easier to focus on how am I breathing, where am I breathing from, how am I singing, where am I singing from. Um, and I've got to say for the relationship of teacher and student, it's really helpful when the student comes and like, I'm feeling this uh, physically, this is what I'm feeling, what's wrong. Um, makes it real easy to be like, oh, it sounds like this, or maybe it's this, um, versus just hearing it and uh, basically guessing. Because <laughs> when you're hearing it, you're like, it sounds like this from my experience, but it might not be. When someone's able to express how they're physically feeling, it's a lot more beneficial to that relationship um, and making things work a lot quicker. Yeah. Uh, again, I've got stuff for that on YouTube, so you can go through the endless amounts of me talking slowly <laughs> into a microphone to help you relax. And there's a few different ones. Um, I have got a few more in mind too that I haven't done yet, but I will. Uh, I think that's all I have to say on breathing. Um, I do want to know that it is really important for singing, but also for everyday life, right? If we're more relaxed and we can take on things a bit better, why not? <laughs> why not do something to make us calmer and slow down versus being panicky and stressed quite a lot? Um, yeah. Should we break or do I just continue? You can continue the. Cool. Yeah. The mind at all. It's set up on the same level, so. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. All right. I don't need to say who I am again. Um, you can, I will split it later. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. I'll say who I am I am Danny Rickett. I, uh, I'm from Christchurch, I didn't say that before, I'm from Christchurch and I moved to Dunedin to study. Um, I studied a Bachelor of Music in my last year, which was my honours year. I did vocal pedagogy and audio engineering. Uh, vocal pedagogy is just a fancy word of saying education. I know about the voice. I went into singing, teaching because uh, I wanted to fund making music, playing music for me. And then I got really into teaching. Um, it's definitely something I need in my life psychologically. So I like that feedback as well. That I don't know, I, that, I think that's why I'm quite psychological in my teaching. I have gone through enough to be like, ah, oh, maybe this isn't as foundational as we think. Maybe there's a lot more to singing than than we think. Um, it's also given to a lot of people for health benefits, so I think that's really interesting. Um, actually, I keep taking on these people that have different reasons for wanting lessons, which um, I'm really, I feel really privileged to be a part of that journey uh, with these people. Um, I am in a band called Mental Splinter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, little plug there. Um, we're going to have one. Um, so I do perform and I write music. That's what I enjoy doing. But I have a um, just over one year old, so I've been in that headspace of like learning to be a mum. I think I'll always be learning to be a mum. So I definitely have been distracted for the best of reasons the past year and a bit. 
Um, so I've just recently gone back into teaching and that kind of headspace, that kind of role again. Uh, yeah, I think that's enough about me. Um, disclaimer on this. So I have always been interested in psychology. Um, you know, I remember in high school people being like, that's not how it is because we have like a, an idea of how things are. And I was always like, but what if this? And I've never really thought of things as like definite. Like I don't think things are definitely this way or certainly like this. I think that every body is different as a physical being. Um, therefore mind is different. And I take that into my teaching. The disclaimer is, uh, there is no resources for this. I haven't looked up things that um, I can be like, look up this book. It clearly explains the psychology of singing like this. This is just my experience, both in my life and through teaching and what I'm seeing with students you know, each day. Um, and every student brings their own being, their own self. I don't, it's hard to explain. I think there's like the structure on what teaching is and like a curriculum, right? And I don't have that. I did. When I first started, again, I've changed quite a lot of my teaching, and I think that that's important to know that we're all learning, right? I definitely had an idea of what needed to be taught. Um, Diaphragmatic breathing is probably one of them. Um, and now it's much more, why are you here? Why do you need to sing? Why do you want to sing? What do you want to gain from this? Um, what do you want to improve? How do you want to feel about this? And then we go from there. I'm not going to be like, you have to learn this, you have to learn this, because everybody is different. I had, you know, I talked about warm-ups in my last video, I think it's very vital to warm up. And I had a student that would come every week and be like, look, I don't have the time for this, we've got half an hour. Um, and so I didn't. I was like, I trust that on the way here, you were going to do stuff in your car. <laughs> um, and I need you to do stuff in your car, and I trust that you're already warmed up when you come to my door. Um, and you know, idea, in an ideal world, I'd make sure that that is the case. But every student is different, and he needed the whole half an hour, and that's okay. Everybody has different um, wants and needs for their time. Some people, psychology, literally just talk to me. Uh, there is one student, sorry if you're watching, but there is one student who has always spent 25 minutes just talking. Um, and we've slowly been like, hey, you want to sing? How do I get you to sing at 20 minutes, um, 15 minutes? <laughs> and our goal is 15, but we are always talking to 20 minutes, I don't know why. But people need to express themselves or, you know, debrief, let go of what's out there before they can get on to what's in here. And I totally understand that. Um, I am, my thinking on teaching is it's your half an hour. You pay for my time and I give you what you want. Uh, not, not in terms of telling you you're great when, when you need some criticism or some work, but in terms of this is your time, you, you choose what you want to get out of it. If you want to talk for half an hour, that's fine, I'm down for that. Uh, I did read an article on um, I wanted to be a singing teacher and I turned into a counsellor, and uh, it's funny because I'm studying counselling, so that's literally my life trajectory. Um, Disclaimer out of the way. I was asked when I first started lessons, what makes you different from other singing teachers? That's where your market is. You need to find what is different about you and market that so that they go to you and not anyone else. And her theory was she would drive all the way to Omer to give her child, and she actually said Omer, uh, to give her child the best lesson if that meant they would get the best lesson. Um, so at the time I thought bands. I was in a university band situation. I knew how to work with bands. Um, I knew how to approach that. So bands. Bands and people who sing live. That's what I thought. Um, I also thought that I would have a lot of young girls. <laughs> that, was, that was my preconceived idea of what singing lessons were because I was a young girl who did singing lessons and I got a lot of older men. Um, oddly, a lot of accountants. I love pointing that out because it's so interesting to me. 
Um, I think now that's changed. I can still work with bands and I can still work with people who sing live. I actually love, love it when my students get to a point of singing live. Um, when I get to see them sing live, that is magic. Um, so it's not like that has gone away, it's definitely still there. However, I think now I have a more psychological approach. I think about how to teach, if that makes sense, how each person needs me to be, not a structured idea. So I had a student ask me recently, um, what do you mean by psycho psychological teaching? Um, and I, I basically mean, I'm going to ask you how you feel a lot. <laughs> I'm not going to be like, I want you to trill this, or I want you to put rasp here because it feels edgy and it feels angry. I'll, I'll ask you to be angry, and maybe rasp will come out. And then we'll talk about what that was and what happened, and did you do it purposefully, um, and then I'll be annoying after that. But I'll genuinely, generally be like, I want you to feel angry first. So, that's what I mean by psychological teaching. Um, okay, I mentioned that I've been singing since I was four. I've had lessons since I was about six. And so I want to note that I'm sure that there are other teachers that teach the way I do, 100%. Um, there is no way, I, don't, I think it's virtually impossible that I'm the only one thinking about psychology and singing. <laughs> like, there is just no way that that's possible. Um, and I'm not the only one talking about it, like, surely. Um, again, I'm going to get resources in the next, <laughs> next few years and then I'll understand more. And I'm sure once I delve into it, it'll be like, oh my goodness, there's so much to learn. Um, and it will be amazing. But when I was four till the end of university, I had, sorry, six till the end of university, I had many different singing teachers. And all of my singing teachers bar one um, didn't focus on emotions or how they connect, um, didn't really focus on the body and how that connects. It was more like breathe from your diaphragm, don't lift your shoulders, the things I was doing in the last video to be fair, um, and not the connection of mind, body, singing. Uh, the one teacher that was the exception um, allowed emotion in his room. So the space was safe for emotion and that pretty much just meant that my co-studiers, but they were friends, um, my friends and I would cry quite often in his space because it was the one space that you could just let all the <laughs> stress out. Um, so the poor guy had to deal with a lot of tears in his room. But it was nice. Um, it was nice having a space to let that out. And I think that we sung better afterwards because we weren't so like, oh, and pent up and just stressed. Um, there was a release of that stress before we could sing. But it wasn't discussed on how to use that. Uh, uh, a point, I guess, where I was like, oh, this is, this is something, was at university. My friend was recording a song that was quite emotional and she cried and at the time Adele had done Someone Like You and she was crying during the chorus when she was recording it um, so I had that in mind where I was like just keep recording just cry and keep recording and see what it sounds like maybe it'll sound terrible maybe you will it's fine you can just delete it um, but maybe it'll sound perfect like raw maybe I will hear it and want to cry um, which is the idea of the song right and I think it was beautiful, I don't know what she thinks. I think it was beautiful, I covered that song for ages. I still cover it now, by the way, just so you know if you're listening. Um, I think all that song was just so, so beautiful. That moment was pivotal to how I think about singing and the mind-body connection. Um, I also allow emotion in my studio, but I do go a step further like I said, just feel angry if the song's angry. Um, what emotions are are you feeling? What does the song make you feel? Um, but it goes further than that, I won't get too far into myself. Um, the body is our instrument and therefore our voice shows that. And I always give the example of 
If you're run down, if you've had a long day, a long week, a long year, your voice kind of goes, oh, hi, what's up, how are you going? And it's really relaxed and quite far back in the throat, kind of croaking. Um, and it takes a lot of energy to be like, actually, I'm feeling really tired, but I'm not going to let my voice fall back and be that tired. It takes a lot of energy. It's really draining. But it's really important because if you continue to be like, oh, I'm so tired, I need coffee. Putting all this hot air past your vocal cords, it's creating a habit. Six weeks to create a habit. Um, it's creating a habit of your voice being like that and you being, when you're feeling tired, your voice does that body and mind connection. If we're tired, our voice is tired. Uh, and you need to put extra energy into displaying not being tired, which is really hard. Um, nerves. You want to take a drink? Then? Nerves are the thing that we are most comfortable, I think, talking about. Most aware of as teachers and performers. Um, adrenaline courses through our body and we're shaking, some people need a drink, some people need to do mindfulness, definitely recommend that. Um, some people need to be away, I know that for myself I'm very shy when I'm not on stage and I'm not performing somewhat, um, so I need time by myself. Everybody needs something to relax the nerves, right? And we're so aware of and comfortable talking about that. But it is an emotional response. It is stress, um, performance anxiety. It's worrying about what ifs. It's anxiety. Um, but we're much more comfortable being like, I'm nervous. Even though there's so much more going on that if we help nerves, we're also helping a lot of other things. Um, I feel like this is an important part to insert the role as a singing teacher. So this is for singing teachers but also for students to like be aware of I guess. I am very aware of my power in the room. Um, I am aware that I mentioned to Jay earlier that the authority, I understand that I am an authority of singing when I'm in that space um, and I don't want to be. I want to you know, I'm there to teach you, I'm, I'm there, I have information that I want to give you if you want it, if you ask for it, I'm there, if you want me to nerd out, I am there, <laughs> I, I've got the anatomy to like talk about if you want it, but I've learned that a lot of people don't, and <laughs> a lot of people don't want to see what the vocal cords look like, which cracks me up every time I show people, they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll look at that, and they're like, ooh, okay, <laughs> um, you should have it, it's great. I think it's great, a lot of people don't, <laughs> but I will nerd out, that's for sure. Um, but I am aware of the power in the room, right? Nerves happen immediately, and I always talk about it. The first lesson, um, I don't expect people to sing. We talk about what we can do. Um, if they do sing, it's breaking the ice and jumping in the deep end, and it makes the next lesson so much easier. But they don't have to because you have to build this trust that I'm not going to shut you down straight away, that I'm not going to say something that will make you feel bad. Um, there are so many just experiences that people have had. Uh, some things that students have said to me. Um, oh, okay, so I'm expected to be a good singer. Therefore, if they sing badly, I'm going to look down on them. Um, I'm there to critique and assess. I write in a book, and I know that that book probably is so intimidating for people. Everybody's got their own book, and I'm frantically writing. And that's just so, uh, at the end of the song, I have this clear idea and, and points of the song that we can go back to, and the exercises to help and to ask what was happening at that point. But I know that that kind of power play of having a book and, I'm frantically writing, what are they thinking in their head? What do they think that I'm writing? I'm so aware of all this in the room because if I say something, it could stop them singing. It could make them silence themselves. <laughs> uh, I know what bad singing is. That's an interesting one to me. Um, I've had that a lot <laughs> where people are like, oh, but you know what bad singing is. Um, yeah, I want to say to students, I don't hear 
bad singing and think, oh, that's terrible, wish I wasn't hearing that. I always hear it like, oh, if we did this, if we worked on this, if I, if I was able to ask them how they're feeling at that point, um, if I'm able to, you know, interrupt the preparation they have in their mind, uh, I'm never listening to it and going, oh, gosh, that's bad. And I've, I've honestly, I've been at gigs where people next to me have been like, oh, you must be struggling hearing this. And I've never struggled at a gig. I, it, it, ah, yeah. It's something I can't understand about people, is that I don't hear, and I get musicians like good music, right? I, I can understand that. But I just don't hear it that way. I, I always hear a performance and think of what was happening, what it could be, what it was. If you put on a great performance, and it's technically not good, but I was feeling it, I'm there. That's, that's another thing, like I, there is one person that I always think of because he was technically not, not good in terms of like, he was pitchy and you could tell just immediately that he was technically not good. And he was like jumping on stage and he was feeling the music so much that I was with him. Like, I was on that ride with him and I was having the time of my life watching him. He was so fun to watch. And I always think of that when people were like, you know what bad singing is, you're gonna judge me. Like, Probably not the way you think I am. <laughs> Probably not the way you think I am. Uh, recently, someone told me um, that they'd heard a singing teacher said they can't sing. And that stuck with me for ages. Why would anybody say that? And I get why you know, uneducated people would say that. Um, people that don't know music, people that don't know singing teaching. I don't understand why a singing teacher would say that. It's such a horrible thing to say. And it's because we've got the power in the room. If we say something like, you can't sing, you're terrible at that, um, they're going to take that home with them. That's not, it doesn't just stay in that room. That's not something to take lightly. That is huge to someone's life. Uh, our experiences shape us. I've had, I'm pretty sure most students I've had, to have a memory that has caused them not to sing or not to better themselves in singing because they've been, been held back in singing for some reason. You know, some of these accountant students just went into accounting in their life and now they're in their 50s and they're wanting to sing because somebody said you're not good. <laughs> somebody said to not do that. Somebody said you're bad. So they went into a different area of life and they're making a lot more money in their life. So there is that. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do, but it's sad to me to hear that they didn't do the thing that they wanted to do. They didn't better themselves in an area of their life because someone held them back by a comment that they made. And as a singing teacher, we have that power. Um, some of the examples I've heard, uh, friends say to stop singing. Um, it's super common in childhood, there's a lot of childhood things that come up in my, in my space. Being made to publicly sing and being humiliated, it's an interesting one. Schools tend to do this. Um, I don't think schools understand the psychological damage of that, but people silence themselves because they associate now singing with humiliation. Um, not ideal, not ideal at all. We want singing to be this emotional expression, um, connection to the body, an experience to have joy. It's literally healthy to sing. It exercises your body, it exercises your mind, it makes you connected to your body physically. Um, and again, with the, the stress of life, we kind of detach from our body quite a lot. So singing is super healthy and very beneficial currently in this grinded kind of life we live. So, yeah, try not to say things that especially as a singing teacher, <laughs> just plead. Like, don't say things that are going to silence people or stop that journey for them. Our job is really to encourage and make people thrive and feel confident. Um, yeah, the, the you can't sing comedy really got to me. My friend in high school said, you ruin all the songs we like. Um, and that stuck with me. We liked listening to rock, you know. We listened to Green Day quite a lot, actually. And uh, I ruined all Green Day songs. Um, <laughs> and and I, I'm, I'm acutely aware of that. Now, I, it's interesting. I don't know whether it's because of that. 
now I very much belt and I rasp and I'm a lot more um, loud and dominant than I used to be. And maybe that's why, I don't know. But we do stick. These things do stick with us. We were like 14 and I still remember that. There are moments in everybody's life, our experiences shape us, that cause us to do or not do things. We want to encourage people to do things. And sorry about all those people who have said bad things to their friends or family because now you're thinking about it and being like, no, just, you know, change now. <laughs> um, emotions and singing. Okay. When a student, and I want to stress this, when a student is uh, diaphragmatically breathing and the pitch is right and they're feeling comfortable, they're comfortable with me and comfortable with singing, we get to a point where I'm like, okay, it's starting to talk about emotions. We, we need to pick a song that makes you angry or sad. Um, I kind of avoid happiness, and I don't know whether that's my own bias, but I feel like more techniques come out with anger and sadness. <laughs> um, or like empowerment, right? Something that makes you feel strong. There are lots of emotions that can be expressed in music and in singing. And I want you to find something that makes you feel something. After that, techniques will come out. Uh, techniques like rasp or trills, um, slurs. Slurs are super common at the moment. I feel like people hide with slurs, I'm not gonna lie. I let people slur away from singing, um, which is an interesting thing to, to note at the moment that people are doing that. I wonder why. Um, we all have access to so much music now. Like, it used to be an album would come out and we we're all talking about that album. And now, I, I don't even know what my students are listening to. That's just, I get educated every week because there's just so much music and access to it and different platforms to find it. It's immense. Um, which is why I'm like, find something emotional, I'm not going to give you something that's emotional. Also, like creep's a fine example, right? Some people find creep very emotional. Um, and it is an emotional song, but it's a song I've heard like a million times <laughs> because so many people sing it, that it's really hard to, to give me an emotional reaction to it. Um, as you did recently, though, if you're watching, well done, because... Genuinely, I like to cry in my space. If I cry, you're nailing it. Like, you are absolutely nailing it. I see that as a compliment. Um, genuinely, I said to someone recently, your goal is to make me cry. He thought that was a great goal. <laughs> That's good. I can't wait for it to happen. <laughs> um, I didn't write this down, but I thought about it. There is a weird thing that happens physically when we hear something and engage with something whether it's just musical singing I find it with singing the most um, you get like that tingle in the back of your neck that's something that I, have, I don't know what that is some of them probably does know what that is but I don't know what that is but again it's that sign of emotional connection if you're able to deliver something that makes them feel something they get a physical sensation that's amazing that's the physical sensation that I would love to have in the room. Most of the time, um, it's gigs that give me that. I don't know if there's just a separation from practice. I definitely see lessons as practice versus performing and the different energy that goes into those two spaces. It has happened in my room, but not, not very often, which is interesting. Um, so not only do we work with emotions in terms of how we make songs better, how we bring out techniques, uh, but also I want to acknowledge that there's emotions in our body. And I know this, I think it's becoming more understood, but it still is kind of airy fairy. It's like that um, over here kind of education, like holistic teaching, right? They're like, oh, is that okay? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's what I think. If you're learning the body, holistic is the best way to go. But I know that this sounds so far out there, but I can guarantee you because it's happened to me and I see it happen to students that this is the case. We keep emotions on our body in different places physically. Um, it's weird and confusing and I don't know why. Uh, I'm sure I will in the future. But <clears throat> if you think of just you know, the most basic, 
if you have been told you're a bad singer um, and you silence yourself, it becomes tense to sing. You can restrict the voice coming out. That can happen with your talking voice too. If you, I, I get it when I'm reading. I don't get it when I'm performing and I know a lot of people get it when I'm performing, but I get it when I'm reading. I'm like panicking so much when I'm reading out loud. And I'm like, <laughs> and like my throat's tensing up. Um, it's because I don't want to be reading to you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't enjoy that process. Um, I now do it every night with a child, so that's getting a bit better in practice, right? But yeah, it, your body finds a way to shut it off, <laughs> make you silence yourself, do what your brain's thinking, right? Your brain's like, what are you doing? Don't do that. So it's starting to close up. Uh, that can happen repetitively for so long that you just have so much tension on your voice. I had a student who did have so much tension on her voice. She went for so long singing with these ideas that people had given her. Um, that she can't sing, she's a bad singer. Um, this is the most extreme as well. This is the most extreme version of what I've seen. And she had these thoughts while she was singing. She had these thoughts of, um, like before a chorus, where you're like, yeah, and you're like a big chorus, she'd be like, oh, I can't do that. Which means she couldn't do it. She was so tense that she couldn't sing a verse without pain. And I, when I met her, was like, I don't know how to deal with this. I've, I never had tension. Um, privileged. I <laughs> like, I never had tension, but something you can do, and I. I had a few students before her that did and I'd done so much learning about it because I was like, I have an experience with myself and I need to learn about this. But with her it was something else, it wasn't this physical thing, it was definitely in her mind. Um, we did physical things to release the tension. There's a good exercise of putting a book behind your head and relaxing your shoulders uh, and she could sing a bit more. But once I asked, what are you thinking, because I could see the face thinking, right? You can see when someone's thinking. What are you thinking? Once we started to go through that, she started to sing more and more quite comfortably. Um, I didn't understand this at the time. I, I didn't know what was happening at the time. I was just there for the ride. Um, but once she actually got to what people had told her, what she was telling herself, she can't sing high notes. She has a really bad low notes. She's pitchy. Um, she can't do it. Once she started to unpack that, and we were like, what if you think you can do it? What if you just pretend you can? Uh, she ended up singing a whole song. And I, I remember that moment of just like, did you feel pain? And she's like, no. It's like, that's such a big moment to have in her life. She can now sing. She can just sing because she wants to sing. And there's no, nothing going on in her mind that's telling her she can't. I think that that's amazing. So emotions aren't just how we use them in song. They can prevent us from singing, they can make us tense. Um, another example of how emotions are trapped in the body. Um, you know, singing, generally speaking, it's in the throat if we've silenced ourselves. Um, I find for myself, when I stop myself from crying, you know that like, swallow it, swallow it, <laughs> swallow it down. You can physically feel yourself swallowing crying. Um, it comes out when I sing. Because that's got to come out at some point. Like, you, it is what it is. It's going to come out at some point. It's like anger. It's just going to build up and build up. And it's going to come out. <laughs> just let it out in little bits, right? Crying on me and watch a movie. Um, that's advice to myself that I won't take. Because I hate it. I hate watching a movie and crying. Um, but you're literally swallowing your emotions, right? So it's trapped there. I have a student who... I'm going to assume... We haven't talked about it. I'm going to assume that there's just been years of swallowing emotions of some sort. Um, and every time there's a breakthrough, they cry. Uh, and I see that as a relief so I think it's really positive. So do they, which is great, because I know people can be quite uncomfortable with emotions. Um, I'd like to think that I've created space that <laughs> it's okay with. Um, I haven't had anyone say that that's not. But I'm not for everyone. Every singing teacher's not for everyone. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, he releases his voice. Um, I want to make a big sound, but I won't. Imagine like someone really just letting go of their voice and just being fully relaxed and screaming. Someone said to me, 
It's just fancy yelling. And it is. No one says not. Um, but it sounds good. <laughs> That's my voice, as <laughs> I literally am. Fancy yelling. Um, and I'll take that. I like it. Um, but when that happens, they cry. Because I guess they haven't allowed that, or they have emotion trapped in their throat. Um, and that's up to them whether they go through that or not. But they seem to like the releasing of that. My understanding is that because the body holds emotion in different places, um, the tense shoulders are a good example, uh, because we hold emotions in different places, when certain things happen that maybe we haven't allowed ourselves or um, remind us of that, could be a song, a feeling, a physical feeling or an emotional feeling, we release that emotion at that time. Um, I think that's really interesting in my space that there's the allowance of that, but also because I allow that, different things keep coming up that I hadn't thought of. Um, I hadn't really thought of how emotion can be trapped before that um, in terms of singing. I did in terms of psychology but I hadn't really brought those two together until I saw it and I was like, oh, um, it seems like it's that, right? Uh, so that's really interesting. Um, so I've talked about emotion in song. I've talked about emotion in body. Um, I've kind of touched on this, but what we tell ourselves is what we are going to deliver. If we tell ourselves we can't reach that high note, then you can't reach that high note. My dad always said, um, can't sort of word. I hate it, because it is, it's in the dictionary. Um, it always drove me insane, can't sort of word, can't sort of word. But it kind of makes sense in terms of when you tell yourself you can't do something, you can't. You're not going to try, you're not going to put the effort in. Um, you're already stopping before you're starting. And I'd like to think, because you've made it to my studio, you've made it into this space, that you already can. You're already there and doing it. You've already made that step. Um, but can'ts happen quite a lot, and I notice it a lot with high notes. And I don't know if this is going to help, but if this helps, I'll give it to you, right? A high note, in terms of muscle movement and physical, is not high, it's just wider stretching, lengths. Um, it's not, ah, it's not higher. It's just further. <laughs> it's just a different way of stretching your vocal cords. There is no low and high. There's just a voice. Um, but I think that this, oh, I have, I can't sing that low or I can't sing that high, really becomes a hindrance. Um, and so many people, so many people think that if you go into... I love teaching bell because that's what I'm about, right? Um, when you go into belt and people think, I can't do that, I can't sing that loud, I can't fill this space, I can't have my voice bounce back at me. There's a fish on a wall um, outside my studio, it's a painting, and I'm always like, sing to the fish. And I know people are like, I can't. I'm like, do it, just, just do it, just pretend to do it. Um, and you probably will. A way to get past that, and this is physical, but I definitely see this as a psychological thing. If you're talking to your friend, um, I always use the backfield because I teach kids as an example, but just across the street, maybe you're at a gig, maybe you're at like, you know, a street festival where they're just like, there's a few people in the way, um, but they really need to hear what you need to say. You're not going to be like, hey, hey, you're going to be like, hey, hey. And that all of a sudden creates a belt voice that you can use and is healthy. It's the difference between screaming for help and screaming for attention. It's nice and strong. I see that as psychological because we go into, I can't do this, I can't do this. And that makes us kind of panic. That panic breathing, everything, the adrenaline, all the things that we're talking about are like coursing through us because we can't do it and someone's making us do it. Whereas if you just think about it, yelling at the fish. The fish really needs to hear what you're going to say. It really needs to hear what you have to say. And you've got to tell it. <laughs> it's going to hear it. It's different. Or throwing your voice, thinking about your voice as uh, a ball in your hand and you want to throw it at a wall. 
Um, there's the psychological tricks. We've been teaching this for years, by the way. Um, we just haven't thought about why we've been teaching it or how it works, I think. Um, I'm sure people have. Just I haven't been explained that when I've been given these exercises in the past. It's a psychological trick to make you into that huh area and not screaming for life. Um, I never get this note. It's another one. I never get this note. Um, and I hear this, by the way. I don't, know, I don't know if students know this, but I hear it when you think this. <laughs> I hear it when you're preparing for a note. I can hear the hesitation building up to a note. Um, it's generally in the chorus, right? It's like some big note, and maybe at home, you've never reached it, right? But this idea of never is not helpful. You've yet to do it, but never. It's, it's as final as can't, I guess. And if we just reword it or rethink it again, it's, it's not a high note. It's not, it's not up here, it's not down here. It's just out here. It can help. Um, there's a lot more that goes into never uh, that would happen one-on-one. -on -one anyway. If you think these things, and you, you're in lessons, by the way, bring them up with your vocal teacher. Get rid of these preconceived notions. Um, I sound pitchy. Why is pitchy such a bad thing? I, <laughs> I think maybe we've been told that pitchy is such a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? If you're pitchy, you're pitchy, right? You can get back to not. You can learn not to be. I always get told, I get asked, um, can anyone sing? Uh, surely there's people that can't sing. I I host, I wouldn't say I teach, I host, I'm there, I am part of a group called Freedom to Sing, and they can all sing, and they're not looking for technical uh, you know, perfection. They're just there for the health of singing. They can sing. Everybody can sing to an extent, you know? Um, so yeah, also I taught someone who, uh, when I first met them, they couldn't hear, couldn't hear that. They could hear it when I went, ah, they could hear me, and we worked through that. So technically speaking, they were tone deaf. Um, they're not anymore. And they took a lot of hard work from them, a lot of hard work. So, credit to them, really. Um, the other thing people say, my voice is bad. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't, like, this is such a weird one for me because, again, it's like when I'm watching a performance and somebody's like, man, you must be struggling to hear this. I don't hear a voice is bad or good. Um, I definitely hear technical. The person who's really technically great. We're working on emotional connection because it's always something to work on for me as well. There's always something to work on, and um, she's technically so good. And there's still something to work on, right? Um, I would say she's better than me and quite a lot of techniques. I'm like, oh, damn! I know what's happening with her voice. Um, so, you know, I understand the mechanisms in place, but she definitely trills a lot better than I can. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, but I don't see a voice as bad. Please, if you think these things, or you think other things, I'm sure there's other things in your mind, bring them up with your vocal teachers. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the positive thing, okay, so like the, the best thing to take out of all of this is if our voice is connected to our body and our mind, and if to relax our mind is relaxing our voice, uh, it means that when you build confidence in your voice, you build confidence in all areas of your life. You're not just building confidence for your voice. You're building confidence for your mind, your body, the connection in, in those two, mind and body, and also other areas of your life. People come and they learn to sing, and they leave with confidence that they didn't have beforehand. Um, I think that that's magical. But it leads to the psychology of singing, right? We learn how to sing and we feel better in general. We feel more confident in general in other areas of our life. And we can take that into other areas of our life. Learn to diaphragmatically breathe and feel more relaxed in general. Um, the 
end of my bedroom. <laughs> I, I wrote a note to myself. Uh, I can say I believe the body as a whole needs to come into our practice and our awareness from singing and teaching. If we are self-aware, we can self-assess, and if we are relaxed, so is our awareness. Um, so are we, I think, as a whole, right? That's the aim, to be relaxed as a whole. That's all I have to say on psychological um, singing, my approach to singing, my approach to teaching, how I think for myself when I perform, but also when I'm teaching others. Um, and I do put this into practice myself. Uh, there is a song I haven't performed with my husband for a while, called The Acoustic Pants. Um, but there's uh, only exception by Paramount. I don't know why, I just heard that at the right time in my life, where I felt so emotional when I heard it back then, that I still do now. And I did perform that song, and I did cry, and I think that I still challenge myself with these. I, I'm still learning how to balance these emotions too. They can become too much, and I'm not saying that when you go on stage you should just throw yourself 100% into these emotions, because it, it's, it's a skill to balance them, and it's a skill to perform with them, and it's a skill to hold that and use that. That's why I talk about it, um, and we practice it. But, yeah, I'm not saying that just go out and do that, but I am saying that I do, and I do practice this, and I do think about this when I'm performing, when I'm writing songs, but also when I'm teaching and how I teach. Um, there's many different ways to teach, and that's just how I do. So, thank you for listening. Um, I'm Danny Ocket. You can check out my YouTube or Facebook for Facebook. Um, but hopefully, Jay will link it. Um, and thank you to Jay as well for inviting me all the way to Homer. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. Absolutely awesome. All right, I have to do another quick shout out, and it's not that I have to, it's because I really want to, and I'm so grateful to um, Creative New Zealand and the Arts Council um, and the Waitaki District Council for making all this possible. Um, and a huge thank you to Danny for bringing her expertise. Um, um, it's really good to hear some of my approaches to teaching coming out in another way. So um, <clears throat> I know my students watching will be going, oh, Jane does know stuff. <laughs> so thank you, Danny, and um, thank you all for watching. And um, those of you who are watching the guitar thing, that'll be around the half past mark. So we'll see you there. Thank you.